Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it's lunchtime. For those of you on the conference, I'm probably keeping you from your lunch. Um, but hopefully, this is worthwhile rather than some of the terrible food outside. Um, my name is Rob McAllister. I work at a company uh, called Filtered, who are just around the corner on uh, D10. And we're going to talk about success with digital transformation, lessons in engagement from Magpie's 100% retention rate. Now, quickly, this is me, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, I worked in the music industry for nine years, um, have been working within digital transformation for probably quite a long time since then moving record labels from traditional marketing into digital marketing, being able to train and develop what they're offering, but then also work digital marketing with uh, events, festivals, artists. And then for the past two years, I've been working at Filtered um, as our head of customer success. And what that means is I get to work with clients such as this. These are our clients that we work with at the moment. Really big variety of clients that are um, huge corporates, FTSE 100 businesses to small charities. Um, there is no one size fits all solution that we offer. So we're able to serve a huge variety of different clients and needs as well. So first of all, before I go into what we've learned, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that we've experienced. And hopefully everyone can still hear me because I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you agree with either one of these or five of these, just to be able to gauge the in the room. So if you think you have too much training content, can you just raise your hand in the air? Okay, so we're looking at like 20%. Bad data, lack of insight. Don't worry, I'm not filming this way so no one can see who's putting their hands up or who's not. Lots of technology and little time to explain who they are. Wasted efforts and money. So you're spending too much money. Small teams and big ambitions. Now, hopefully, everyone will put their hand at that one. Um, so does anyone feel like they, hopefully, there's a real mixture in the room that people have probably experienced one of these, two of these, maybe all five of these. And what we're trying to do is help learning development teams overcome these issues. And I'll take you through how we're doing this very quickly, but also some of the learning we've experienced while doing this. We did a webinar, or I did a webinar two or three weeks ago, and just for the people here, um, we put a question out about whether people feel like they, or L&D professionals, have a good grasp of data and insight. And you can see that two thirds of them felt like they didn't have enough data or the right data to deliver a truly personalized learning experience. So how can we address these problems? So AI driven on personalization, if anyone uses Spotify, Netflix, You'll be very familiar when you go home, you leave your work, you listen to music, you're being recommended what to learn next. Like I said, I worked in the music industry and I, I would say Spotify recommends me the best music uh, from a one-to-one -one basis every week than any of my friends. Um, so it's able to understand what I listen to, what I've previously listened to, and tell me what to listen to next. Same for Netflix, if you use Netflix, you'll probably watch something, it'll recommend you the next thing. What we're trying to do is take that concept and use that for learning. So the service that we have, or the platform that we have, is called Magpie. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it or haven't been to the stand yet, come along. We'll show you it. We can run you through it. Um, what we're trying to do is to collate your learning resources into one place. But most importantly, every single person in your business or that you work with will get a personalized experience based on who they are, what they learn, but most importantly, over time, it doesn't matter really who they are, it's one, what they've learned previously. You can have two people that are project managers that have very different learning needs, as we all know. So the tool, a Magpie, will be able to identify those skill gaps, provide you assets or learning resources that will plug those skill gaps for you. And we incorporate some of the best content around the web. So you've got TED, Harvard Business Review, Future Learn, various assets that we've curated ourselves to be able to deliver to a really high quality skills framework. So I've given you the very, very quick sort of this is what we do, just so everyone in the room is at a similar level. Um, now, really into why you're all probably sitting here is to get some insights and some tips of sort of how you can apply these things to yourself. So the, the biggest thing that we have sort of taken from all of our clients, we've probably launched 25 different learning initiatives over the past year is positioning. 
It's not necessarily the, um, the content is really, really important. The user experience is really, really important. But actually, how you position that learning is the number one thing based on the organizations that we go to. We've experienced as a new platform, um, we have clients that maybe describe us as an AI-driven personalization learning solution. Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Doesn't necessarily read very well in an email. So what we've had to do with a lot of clients is talk them through the benefits. And some of the benefits are going to be really obvious to you, to us, to learning professionals. But to someone that has five minutes a day to learn, we need to really grab their attention to be able to get them to actually take advantage of the tool. So you've got maximizing your learning time. You bring multiple content, in, content libraries into one place, especially if you work for a large organization. If you want to learn about Excel or how to conduct a meeting, you probably have to think for about five minutes where to go. Do you go to SharePoint? Do you go to Coursera, Get Abstract? All these great providers that your organization has paid for you, but you're still not sure where to go. And if you don't know where to go, you go to Google. And then literally, you don't really know what you're going to get on Google. So the whole idea of what we're offering is that we have gone to Google ourselves, found out what's relevant, and been able to curate those resources to you. So they're going to be really, really, um, we're not going to waste anyone's time, because we know what they need to learn. And also, we're providing them good content that we know solves that problem. And there's an expansive user experience like this as well. Just as my music taste has changed over the last nine years when I've been using Spotify, my Magpie experience will change as I progress in my career. So if I'm an apprentice, I will need to learn very different things about teamwork than someone that is a chief executive or someone that's a team leader. So the content will be adapted to that person. And again, it's that personalized experience. And the last thing, sorry, is just new features. Um, it sounds really, really silly, but emailing people to say that you have new content in the system or that you have a new feature, even if it is a tick box, is a great opportunity to talk to people and a reason for them to go back. Um, so from a positioning perspective, these are the five things that we have sort of talked to our clients with. And this does change. If there is a clear learning initiative across the business like digital transformation, then our positioning will change to be very much related to digital transformation. If it's about onboarding, if it's about resilience, obviously we'll have customized marketing campaigns around what we're actually trying to achieve. Another really obvious one, but necessarily doesn't come out all the time, is to use the channels that your organization already use. So if you don't use Slack in your organization, don't launch a learning uh, platform and, uh, and use Slack as the way to communicate it. Generally, and I, when I say generally, 71% of people that we've surveyed would prefer to have learning suggestions or reminders to learn via email which generally blows the socks off all of the people we speak to because we all feel like we receive too many emails. But 71% of actual learners want to learn via email. What really surprised me is 12% of people wanted to learn or receive a notification via SMS. For me personally, I think you know, my number is very different to my work, so I wouldn't want to do that. But I found that really interesting as well. So people just don't want to be serviced. The thing that was the lowest from the recommendations of how they want to receive learning um, nudges or notifications, 7% of those people that we surveyed was via their LMS. So people were trying to think outside of their LMS and provide recommendations or provide learning nudges via platforms they already use. So email, we all use email all day. I'm sure people have been checking their emails today, put your out of office on or whatever you've needed. Um, identify your that's a really spread out image. I'm sorry about that. Identify your internal champions. So um, very, very obvious. One of the things that we've really, really relied on and, and been helpful for success is to be able to have some key people in the organization that are really going to back the initiative. To be able to tie that into something like digital transformation is really helpful. But having someone in your organization that has some clout or some influence to be able to say that they are behind the tool and they're going to test it or they're going to try it is really, really useful. But also, not for them just to try it, but for their team. To be able to create an internal case study for the tool to share with other people in your organization. And again, I was told to chuck this in here just in case anyone left and people came back. But luckily, not too many have left. So just in case you don't know, we're Magpie. Um, so I'm going to move on. Um, there is going to be no money exchanged as we play this quick game. Um, this is just a, a, what we're trying to talk about here is the insight that we gain from our tool in the fact that data. 
And I've been saying to people on our stand today, I worked in the music industry for a very long time, and there are things that we would do with data seven years ago that many that it would be very, very revolutionary to the learning and development industry. So what we're trying to do is to use data and inform our clients of how this data could be used. So one of the easy things just for everyone to grasp is what day do people learn? So can I just get a raise of hands again, just because I know that everyone was able to do it. If you think, and this is, you know, there is no right or wrong answer. I'm not expecting anyone the answer to this question right now, but think about your organization. And the, first of all, do you even know when people learn? But if you think people learn the most on a Tuesday, just raise your hand. Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Okay, the answer is Wednesday. And this is grouped usage. So you'll see that actually there's a very small difference here. The red line or the red dots are overall Magpie usage. But we have a client here who's a FTSE 100 company. The blue line is their usage on the system. So it's not a one size fits all solution. We can't just say to every client, let's talk about learning on a Wednesday because it's the busiest day. For this client, it would be a Thursday. And we would talk to them, and we'd either send emails out on a Thursday. We would try to understand as well, on a Tuesday, what has gone wrong in this organization where so few people learn on a Tuesday. It could be that that's their internal meetings day. Everyone has to. But we start to build a better picture of the needs of the organization by using this data. Now, the next one, um, just from, a, again, no prizes for people that get the right answer, is what time do people prefer to learn? If you think it's between 8 and 10, if you can raise your hand. One or two people, 10 to 12, 12 to 2, and 2 to 4. So the majority of people, I think, got this right. Oh, sorry, which was 12 to 2. So that lunchtime period is really, really interesting and really useful for people to be able to do a little bit of learning. And I'm sure in our, in our office, for example, I see my colleagues either reading things, watching TED Talks, on their lunch break while having a bit of lunch as well. So it's a really good opportunity to start to talk to people about learning during these times. But again, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. That doesn't necessarily make sense for the organization that we've been working with here in the blue. So their top time was at the very end of the day, between four and five. So again, we're able to tailor our communication. We're able to give them a better idea of what's going on in the organization and how their learners are learning. Obviously, there's a variety of different things that could influence this. People could finish at 8 o'clock and start at 12, so that could be middle of the day-ish. But we will, have a, we will talk to the client, get a better idea of what they actually want to achieve and how this data is going to be useful. Now, the other thing that, for the data that we provide, which is generally really helpful from an engagement perspective, but also to be able to increase engagement, we need to have content that people find appealing or that they actually want to interact with. So the red here, and I put this in big just so I remind myself, the red is for overall Magpie usage. And you can see that video um, articles, sorry, are the biggest set of content that people like to consume. Video is second, and then it decreases down to online courses, podcast, document, webinar, other. For the same client that I've shown you the two other graphs, there is, is very, very different. Video dominates usage. Articles are still very, very popular. But we were able to talk to them and go, why do you think video usage is higher for you compared to our others? What their answer was is in our existing LMS, videos are very, very poorly used, or they're not necessarily optimized for mobile. Um, so actually, having a platform that is fully responsive, that is available to watch videos via TED or other providers, was revolutionary to the way that this group learned in that organization. And from a curation perspective, the way that we can improve the service, and that's one of the big things that we do try to do with all of our clients, is iterate, is not a case of set and forget the solution. The whole idea of machine learning and personalized learning is it continually evolves and adapts, is the fact that we will go to that client and say, okay, well, it looks like documents are very poorly used in your organization. If that is really important document, is there a resource that we could use that is equally good that we could put in here because we know it's going to get more usage? So again, it's maximizing engagement based on the data we have. Sorry, I've skipped the one here. Um, I'm just going to check time. So the other thing that we have here is a lot of clients come to us and they think, oh, our content isn't that good, which is really sad, first of all, that someone would come to us, a client, and say, our content isn't that good right now but also that they feel like the HBR or TED is going to get a lot more interactions or a lot more engagement. This client that we had here, um, we were able to 
ingest their own content into our system along with other resources like TED, HBR, The Economist. And what you see, that what this graph is trying to say is actually there is a huge amount of interest in resources that came from the organization that people work for. And you can see that the average views per asset is double, which are not. So a lot of people come to us and say, hey, I just want to include external content. It's very easy for us to do that. But actually, what we're trying to do is start that conversation that there is a huge brand loyalty for a lot of employers to internal content. So let's get that in the system too. There's things that when people go in and they want to deliver personalized learning is we can all read something about meetings, but generally we'd probably like to read something about how meetings are conducted in your organization where you work so you can understand the culture. So the other thing is how do you make the most of this data? And there's a, there's a real, the reporting that we give is, is probably one of, I work in customer success, so just to give you a bit of clarity, is I am here to help our clients achieve their goals. And the data is a really, really important way for us to do that. So we work with facts, not myths. So when a client comes to us and says, hey, can we send an email out this week to try and get some engagement? We can go, yeah, we can. What day would you like to send it out? And we're able to use the, the data in our system to be able to say, well, you think it should go out on a Monday. Maybe it should go out on a Wednesday based on let's reinforce this positive habit. And actually, let's send it at 12 to 2 because we know that there's a little bit of usage already happening within your organization, which exactly what I've just said. So while I'm just going to click that, I'm going to have a quick sip of water. The other thing that um, I'm, uh, usually I don't mention this too much, but from the conversations we've been having on the stand this morning, it becomes very, very relevant, is you can use the data to identify skill gaps in your organization. Now, the data that we have, we don't host any mandatory content or compulsory content which I think proves that the data that we have is so valuable because people are doing it on their own accord. They're going in and saying, OK, well, I'm not very good at public speaking, so maybe I should get better, and I'm going to go in and do some re use that as a skill to develop, which allows us to then get a really good picture over what people want to learn, and we can start to dissect why they want to learn that and prioritize skill gaps in the organization. We had one client that we work with, I went in and gave I'm just seeing if anyone's there from that organization. I don't think so. I went in and gave a sort of presentation to their HR team, 50 people in the room, their entire HR team. And I was able to look into our statistics and say the number one asset in our system for you is how to interview for a new job. The company was going through quite a lot of change, and that was terrifying to a group of HR professionals that are trying to work on the retention of those employees. So we can give you some insight that maybe you don't necessarily know, we're not telling them who has looked for a new job or who has looked at that asset, but overall, you can get a real temperature of what the organization feels. And then you work with your HR teams or the L&D teams or the wider team in general to be able to uncover why these are popular times and can this behavior be expanded or addressed, especially for people looking for a new job. Is there something culturally that the organization can do? Could it be that we can offer some, some more supportive content in here to be able to upskill rather than maybe look for another job? Or can we start to talk to the organization to understand why people are feeling like that? Now, my last slide, and I realize I've talked very quickly and whizzed through this, but I'm very conscious that people are on lunch, trying to get lunch as well, is over the past year, we've worked with 25, 20 to 25 clients with, um, and what, you know, what the title says is true, we've managed to maintain every single client through that year. There's been a variety of different success, but what we've been able to do is a really good picture of what things a client needs to do with us collectively to be able to achieve a really good result in the organization. And this doesn't have to be for Magpie. I would assume this could be for any learning provider. But if you are uh, another learning provider and you want to steal these, just put our logo on them if you do, please. So the first one, and I'm sorry that the font is so small, eight, and I didn't want to get another slide because it feels like I'd have too many slides, is there's a wide digital or there's a wide company initiative that Magpie can link to, such as onboarding, digital transformation, well-being. If you have a message that nearly every single person is being communicated with in their one-to-ones with their manager, in their team meetings, in the weekly calls, it's really easy then to be able to tie in some usage to a learning 
to be able to say, okay, well, it's number one objective in the organization to learn about digital transformation. This is a tool that's going to help you achieve that. Um, one thing that may sound like common sense, and probably all of them sound like common sense, but this one maybe in particular, is can you define success metrics that will mean something to the organization? When we have conversation in 12 months of, do you want to work with us again? If we have clear success metrics, we both know very transparently whether you're going to work with us or not. Because if we've got close to those, we can have a really nice conversation, pop the champagne, pat each other on the back. If not, then we were able to address that and go, okay, well, what can we do to be able to get closer to those metrics? And that is one of the things that I think um, learning, we, there's a lot of conversation around whether learning can be quantified or not. The benefits in uh, learning obviously are very wide, and I'm not going to tell people what the benefits are. I'm sure everyone knows that. But have a clear idea of why you are starting this initiative and why you're asking people to learn, and see if you can tie that to something that every single person in the business will at least understand and care about. Very obvious, you have a C-level sponsor. If you have someone that can pull strings, make things happen, it's super helpful. Or if you have someone that is very influential in the business, like I said, and able to talk very, very fluently about what we're trying to do, it, I cannot tell you um, how important that is. The other thing is to have a group of senior champions. Um, so way, the way that we roll out with clients generally is to do an alpha, which is, you know, very small group, they get a feel for the technology, make sure that the recommendations are okay, weightings are right. We then go to a beta, which is a slightly bigger group, and then we'll roll out to the whole organization. I've never just gone, here's the tool, put it out to 10,000 people, let's do it. The whole idea is for us to improve the service and refine it to your organization as we launch, which is why having a group of senior people in there is fantastic because it allows us to build a relationship with them. It allows them to feel like they're part of the learning initiative. But also, it means that we can create a really good case study to say that, OK, well, this group or this NHS trust was part of this test. This is what we achieved with them, and the results are really positive. It allows us to sell that into other stakeholders in the business very, very easily if you have a good case study. And that's my next point. And then, um, two last things is um, you have the ability to communicate regularly with your learners. This is one thing that really surprised me um, working with clients is the, the lack of ability to actually talk to users on a mass scale. You're obviously allowed to talk to senior talent partners, HR, people that have direct content. But as a centralized L&D team, I'm always surprised at the lack of ability to be able to email a thousand people in one go or to be able to talk to a wide group. And if you're able to communicate that, and we do this for a couple of our clients, is we send behavioral emails, we send engagement emails to obviously get people back into the system and do it. But if you can get the ability to communicate with people regularly, then the results are going to be absolutely massive because you can remind them to learn, you can reinforce why they should be learning, but also you can highlight other things in the organization that they should care about. That could be email, that could be Yammer, it could be whatever, whatever tool you use. If you don't use either of those, I'm sure everyone uses email, but if you don't use Yammer, it could be Microsoft Teams, it could be Facebook Workplace, it could be anything that you use, it could be WhatsApp, whatever you decide to do. As long as people are comfortable using it and you can create some kind of community to say, because I, I'm going through this tool, I found this really useful, maybe you will too, and you recommend it to someone socially, it has a huge effect, but also what we're creating in these three points here, let me just use the laser pen, these three points here are, is momentum. Momentum internally that this is something that people are paying attention to, we're getting positive results, people are talking about it. And the biggest growth we've had with our accounts is starting off with a very small group, we showcase success, and all of a sudden that project or stakeholder has 12 people chomping at the bit to get part of this tool and to be part of the initiative as well. And the last one is we can provide you, this is when you know, we're finalized, so all the people taking pictures, this is the one you want if you do want the picture, um, is the ability to act on those learning insights. So we're going to give you a great set of data. We're going to guide you how to use that data. We can't actually act on a lot of that data, for example, if it is curating certain content or going to your content provider and asking for more of a certain topic. You will have to do that. We will inform you, we will provide you great analytics. We have a very, very strong data science team internally that will give you the habits of your users, why they learn. 
But there's also a responsibility from all of our clients to actually go and act upon that and use it. So that's our checklist for success. And if you can get to four of those, maybe three of these, we're pretty confident that we're going to have a really good relationship together and we're going to be able to get a really good use of the tool in your organization. Our best performing clients have hit all of eight. And generally, as anyone that has small budgets or large budgets, the larger budget you have, the more of these you want to hit because you want to make sure that you reinforce the budget that you've spent. So it's a really interesting case from our looking at who we work with, the size of the organization. These are the patterns and the trends that we've picked up that can really help drive learning in your organization. So that's me. Um, I don't know whether anyone, um, if I'm allowed to do questions or if anyone does have questions, but we're at stand uh, D10 around there. Um, for the eagle-eyed on you, there's been at the bottom of my thing, 4, 4 p.m., um, we're having some drinks. If anyone wants to come over to our stand and have some drinks. And Vinit, I think, is going to ping some people, so is Martin. If you want to speak to us, if you want to sign up for our mailing list, either come and grab us or Vin and uh, Martin in the gray, gray jumper there and white polo shirt. We'll just scan people if that's okay with you before you leave. Have a wonderful day and enjoy your lunch.